So I um, confused Milton a little bit this morning because I changed our second reading to the Ephesians text. There was a text out of 1 Corinthians that it was supposed to be today that said something like, live as though you are not married. But with so many women away on a cruise, I thought that would be inappropriate. <laughs> so I chose the Ephesians text instead. Today we uh, finished the sermon series, Big Questions or Big Answers, and uh, today the last question is, what about non-Christians? Are they saved? And I've talked about this before in the past, but every time I, I sit down and write a sermon with this as the topic, I always, um, I always come to the conclusion that I don't really know. Um, but I'm going to give it my best guess. And today I'm going to use our readings to do that. First, uh, as Christians, as people of God, we lean on this Ephesians text. As Lutherans, we love this Ephesians text that we have been, uh, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, the gift of God. And so because of our faith in God, we walk through life confident of our place in, in eternity, confident of our own salvation. And, um, and for me, um, I don't know about you, but... Being confident of my place in eternity, in heaven, salvation is comforting. And it uh, gives me hope. And it, um, it, it is a part of every decision I make in life. But what about non-Christians? Um, the first uh, text I want to use is the, the gospel. About the man who... Uh, this had uh, it just come to me. I know, I've heard this text, uh, read it a hundred times. Maybe a thousand. But um, Jesus had come home. I always thought about... What about the guy who owned the house? How upset would he be that somebody broke through his roof? And then I thought, well, this is probably Jesus' house. It says he came home. And uh, if, if, if you were Jesus sitting in your living room and somebody came through the roof to see you, uh, just, it's a sheer miracle that Jesus wasn't upset. Or living in Texas that Jesus, you know. <laughs> anyway. Um, but... You would imagine, if you were in this story, if you were one of the friends of the uh, paralyzed man, and they, uh, they heard that Jesus was coming, um, I, if the paralyzed man said, hey, will you please carry me to Jesus so that I can be healed? If you were that man's friend, you would probably say, yeah, I'll carry you there. Um, and so you would carry him, and then you would see that there's such a large group of people outside of Jesus' house that... Uh, I don't think we can get to him. I just don't think we can get to him. Um, and then if the guy would say to you something like, well, just take me down through the roof, you might be like, um, yeah, I don't know if that's going to work. Um, we ask friends to help us, but friends will only help us to a certain point. Unless it's our friend's idea. It's our friends who come to, to us and say, hey, listen, Jesus is home, and we're going to put you in front of him. We're going to get you to him. And so they take the man, and the man probably saw the crowd and said, oh, it's not going to work. There's too many people. And the friends probably said, oh, no, we're going to make it happen. I've had a, a number of friends in my life who have um, been there for me to encourage me in times of trouble, in times of, well, just an easy example is when I was a second-year seminary student, I had begun running. I was running 5Ks, um, but I had never run four miles. It was a goal of mine to run four miles. And one of my college uh, seminary roommates, had, uh, it was his first year, and he just finished an Ironman triathlon. Um, so he was in pretty good shape. Um, and I said, I'd like to run four miles, and I couldn't find anybody to run four miles with me. He said, I'll run four miles with you. And so the, the uh, perimeter of the uh, seminary was a, a sidewalk, and we figured it was four-tenths of a mile. And so we ran it ten times. Um, and by running it, I mean we jogged really slow around it ten times. And I could just tell this guy who had just completed an Ironman, who can run probably uh, ten miles in an hour, he was just barely walking it. But... Um, but he was there next to me the whole time, saying, come on, you got this, come on, you can do this, come on. And I, and I was just breathing really heavy, oh, oh, okay, okay. You know, and, but he was there with me the whole time, pushing me, encouraging me, helping me, saying what I needed to hear so that I could finish. 
And I feel like that's what these friends were doing for this man. They would not let him fail. They wanted nothing more than to get him in front of Jesus. It wasn't to help them. It was something they wanted for themselves. And we have friends, a number of friends, who would help us out if we needed. But I think we only have a few friends who would be there for us, who wouldn't let us fail. And those are the type of friends we all need. And so when we think about non-Christians that are our friends, or maybe our family, that we worry about whether they believe or not. God calls us to be that friend who stands beside them throughout their entire life and who continues to encourage them into a life of faith. Because in the end, it's not really up to us to heal the man. It's up to us to get him in front of Jesus. And we never know what's going to happen if we get them in front of Jesus. The reality is, every person we meet is going to be in front of Jesus one day. And it just might be your effort that when they stand in front of Jesus, Jesus looks at them and smiles and says, what great faith. Your sins are forgiven. And they might say, I never had faith. Yeah, but the faith of your friend has carried you this far. So, just encourage you to not give up on the people you know and love. But what about people that we don't know, people who live far away, people who we see are clearly not Christians, and it doesn't look like any amount of Christianity in their life is going to make a difference. Uh, the story of Nineveh. Nineveh was a city that was not, a, it was not an Israelite city. It was not a city full of Jewish people. It was not a city full of people of God. It was a city um, of sin. It was a city of debauchery. And it was a city that God decided needed a change or it was going to be destroyed. And so God sent Jonah to go to Nineveh and tell them that in 40 days, destruction is coming unless they change their ways. And Jonah didn't really want to do it because Jonah thought, well, they're going to kill me if I tell them. And, God, and so Jonah tried to run away. And then we got Jonah in the whale for three days coming back. We've all heard that story. And so finally Jonah decides, fine, I'll go. And so Jonah walks into the middle of this huge city and says, in 40 days, you're all going to be destroyed. And everyone stops and says, whoa, did you hear what he just said? Did you hear what that foreigner just said? In 40 days, our city's going to be destroyed. We, we should change our ways. And they did. And God changed his mind. That's what the text says. It's easy for Christians to look at non-Christians and say, the Bible says you're not getting into heaven. The Bible says you're not saved. I don't think you're saved. But what's great about this story is that God gives them a chance. Our God is a God of chances. You have been a terrible person your whole life. You have been a terrible city for a long time. I should have destroyed you years ago, but guess what? I'm giving you another chance. And God changed his mind. I think the uh, common narrative about this story or the story of our life is that we all have one last chance, but when we die, our chances are over. I don't know if that's true, though. And so I'm not going to stand up here and say that if, uh, when I I was in high school, my grandmother um, uh, was living alone, and and her, uh, um, my grandfather's brother was living alone, and he was dying. And he was in his, uh, he was probably close to 90, Uncle Ernie. And she said, I want you to go with me to see Uncle Ernie because I need to hear before he dies that he believes in God. I've been talking to him about God his whole life and he's never said it. And I need you to come with me. So I said, okay. So we went to visit Uncle Ernie. And um, Uncle Ernie, well, nobody really liked him. And so nobody really wanted to go visit him. Um, But we went. And, um, and I was scared. I was afraid. I was afraid that he was going to lash out at us 
And, um, and we went and visited him. And, and my grandmother sat down and said, Ernie, I got to know. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in God? And he said, yes, Barbara Dean, I believe in God. She said, that's all I needed to hear. And we left. Because it was important for her to know that he believed because he was about to die. Um, I know that that's a common thing that Christians think. That if somebody doesn't express their belief before they die, they have no chance. But I don't know if it's true. Because if our God is a God of chances in this life, why can't God be a, chances, uh, be a God of chances after this life is over? Again, I don't know. Uh, I've loved this sermon series. I love the questions that you've all have asked. I've loved the thought process and the study that's gone with it. But I've come to the conclusion again that the more I study, the more I realize I don't know any of the answers. And so my best guess is all I've given you. And I know that one day I'm going to stand in front of Jesus and I'm going to have to account for every word I said right here. And I'm going to be wrong about stuff. But I'm going to be able to look at Jesus and say, I may have been wrong, but I've erred on the side of grace because that's what I think you would have wanted me to do. Amen.